My name is Samantha Chokin. I'm the manager of public programming here at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust. I'd like to welcome you to tonight's program, Tehran Children, with author Nicole Dekel. Before we begin, a few words about this institution. This is the third largest Holocaust museum in the world, offering a range of rigorous and engaging exhibitions, programs, and resources. In a world of rising intolerance, anti-Semitism, and Holocaust denial, we are called upon to be bolder in our mission of education and outreach than ever before. If you would like to receive information about upcoming programs, exhibitions, and special offers, please join our mailing list. A sign-up sheet is on the table over there, as well as information about our membership opportunities. I'm pleased to welcome our speaker for tonight, Mikhail Dekel. Born in Haifa to a Holocaust refugee father and Israeli mother, Michal practiced law in Israel before relocating to the United States and embarking on a career in academia. Today she teaches English and Comparative Literature at City College and CUNY Graduate Center and directs CCNY's Rifkin Center for the Humanities and Arts. Tehran Children is the culmination of Michal's decade-long journey to understand her father and his wartime odyssey which began in Nazi-occupied Poland and ended in British-controlled British Palestine, winding through Russia, Uzbekistan, and Iran. Although this route had been followed by the majority of Polish Jewish survivors of the war, this fact was virtually unknown when Mikhail began writing the book. After her talk, there will be time for questions and answers, so do save your questions for the end. McCall's book is also available for purchase in our gift shop downstairs, and after the program, she will be signing books in the lobby, so stick around for that. Uh, I would like to please ask you to take this moment to silence all mobile devices and avoid disruptions during the program. Thank you, and please join me in welcoming McCall. Thank you, Samantha, for organizing and for the introduction. Let's see if I can do this properly. So, 10 years ago, I set out to write a book about a man whom I saw every morning and evening and weekends um, for the first, I think, 18 years of my life, my father. Um, I did not know this man very well. He was uh, quiet, reticent, slightly depressive, slightly enigmatic man. I knew little about him. I knew even less about his past. I knew that he had been born in a Polish town called Ostromazowiecka. I knew that he came to what was what would become Israel, uh, mandatory Palestine, with a group of children through Tehran, and that those group of children uh, are known Tehran children. I did not think of my father as a Holocaust survivor. To me, he was a Tehran child, one of the lucky few who were rescued. He was uh, an engineer in the Israeli Air Force, and he was simply kind of an Israeli man to me. Um, and um, and he died relatively young in 1993 from uh, the de degenerative brain disease, Yakov Kreutzfeldt, mad cow disease. Um, so he died very suddenly and was one of only very few cases in Israel. And at that time I came here and as Samantha said, I um, kind of came here for a vacation after passing the bar exam in Tel Aviv and that became a very, very long vacation. <laughs> until now. Um, and so I wasn't really um, engaged in, in this kind of research until 2007. 2007, uh, I'm at a faculty party, I teach at CCNY, um, and I'm talking to an Iranian-American colleague, and the Iranian-American colleague says, hey, do you know anything about Jewish children who are in Iran during the war, World War II? And I say, um, yes, I do, uh, as a matter of fact. Um, now, if you recall, 2007, 
were um, those were the the years of uh, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, um, who who was a Holocaust denier, and so there was a lot of literature about sort of Iran, Iran's sort of role in the Holocaust and 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 sort of articles about that claim that Iran was complicit in Salar. My colleague read it, read, some, read something in the Iranian paper that said, look, we were not only were we not complicit, but we saved. Jewish children during the war, and um, I, you know, was taken aback. Salar asked me questions: How did they get to Iran? Who took them there? Um, what were the details? I didn't know many of the details, and his questions really became the book. Um, and now that I'm talking about the book, I'll just go back and say one thing: is that um, if those of you who are on Twitter. Or on social media, please follow me. Um, at this, because uh, so one of the things that has happened with this book is that um, you know I wrote a book, like an academic in my pajamas in a library, and then suddenly the book came out and became bigger than that. Um, and my publisher at Norton said, "That's horrible. You have no social media presence. It's absurd." So. Um, now that I remember, it was like, follow me um, on, on, on Twitter or Facebook, any of these things. So back to our story. Um, so as I said, uh, so I set out to write a book about my father, and then I set out to write a book about these Tehran children um, who were just under a thousand Jewish children, Polish Jewish children, who ended up in, in Israel, in pre-state Israel. But the story that I ended up writing is more than their story. It became the story of most Polish Jewish survivors. Uh, and these are the people who survived in the Soviet interior, in Central Asia, in Iran, in India, in mandatory Palestine, in Lebanon, even in Syria and elsewhere. And so, you know, this was, you know, this is very hard to grasp. And I mean, I've been giving a lot of talks, and in each, almost in each one of them, the organizer calls me and says to me, can you reiterate the numbers again? And I say, yeah, uh, because if we think about Poland before the war, it's, there were roughly three and a half million Jews in Poland before the war, under that. 10% of them survive in 1945, and of those, so about 350,000 of those, roughly 200, 230 to 250,000 survived in this way in, as refugees in the Soviet Union, in Central Asia, and the Middle East. And so I ended up writing the story of a majority of survivors who had not really been recognized as survivors in the sense that um, they, I mean, in, in the 1950s, as we know, there was a reparation agreement between Israel and um, Germany. They were not included in this in this reparation agreement, um, and, um, and 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 also, you know, despite what we know is a tremendous Holocaust research over the past decades, the past three or so decades, especially, they have not very re been researched very much, and they have not received treatment in not entirely nothing, but not very much. Um, in popular culture, I mean, I, when I was growing up, I definitely didn't go to any sort of Holocaust commemorations f where my father was invited, he didn't speak to children, and so on. So um, there was no story, and my, my book became the story um, of my father, but also uh, of, of uh, the survivors of the East and, and other people working in this as well. Um, at the same time, the book remains, I think, an intimate memoir of my father. In some ways, it is a second-generation memoir of a daughter whose father had the symptoms of a survivor without the story of the survivor. And, and, and I'm sort of I know, pleased I wrote that, even though he's, obviously he can't read it. So um, what I'd like to do in the next I don't know, 30 minutes or so, 35 minutes, is to describe to you this particular cluster of fates uh, that belong to these hundreds of thousands of survivors who uh, seems to have fallen off the map of Holocaust study and commemoration. And uh, I also want to describe my own journey in their footsteps, because the book is not just about what happened in the past, it's also about what happens to me in the present as I follow 
them around the globe, more or less. Um, so I want us to try to understand the, these fates by imagining two young persons, a boy and a girl, 12 and 7, at a particular moment, August 1939. These siblings live in a country that has the largest Jewish population in Europe, Poland, and in a town who, where a third of its residents are Jewish, 60% during their parents' time. So I was able to, to actually travel to Poland and do quite a bit of research about their pre-war life as well, and if that is a chapter in the book, um, I actually have maybe, I don't know, hundreds of pages more about that, but that, that didn't go into this book and maybe will go into another book, but uh, I do know quite a bit about my father's pre-war life as well. Um, the family has lived in this town, in Ostrowiecka, for eight generations. The boy has never has left town once for a tonsillectomy in Warsaw, which is 60 miles away. So Ostrowiecka is sort of in the middle between Warsaw and Bialystok. The siblings, uh, the girl, has never left town. So uh, the siblings are my father, Hanania Teitel, uh, his sister Regina, and behind them are their parents, Rachela, Rachel, and Zindel. Now, let us imagine them three years later. So obviously I don't have their picture, but this is what it looked like. This is, these are um, Polish, soldiers disembarking on the shores of Bandar Pahlavi um, in Iran. It's, this is, a, this is a, a, a kind of coast town in northern Iran on the Caspian Sea. And among them, these children are embedded. So we, we, we looked at the photo from more or less um, mid-1939, now we're in August 1942. Um, these children, um, have traveled over 5,000 miles. If you look at the, Young people from among the refugees were not that much older than them, like in their early 20s, 
and they are basically um, people who are in Zionist youth movements, mostly Nashomer Atzair and the Socialist Zionist movement in Poland, and they came as, as refugees, and they are sort of managing these children. Um, in a month after their arrival is the high holiday. I mean, I should say uh, there were a few um, there were a few transports, but um, most of the children came in August 1943, and a month later is Yom is Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, and some of the children are taken to a synagogue in Tehran. Um, this synagogue is uh, this is actually a picture from today. The synagogue still exists the way it did. And if you look at the Torah mark, for those of you who can read Hebrew, it says, Bet HaKneset HaYudim Eropeim, the synagogue of the European Jews. So this was actually a part of the synagogue, of a local synagogue that was cordoned off for the European Ashkenazi refugees who were in, in Iran. So it wasn't just these children, it wasn't just these Polish, Polish uh, refugees, there were Jewish, there were uh, German Jewish refugees in Iran, Austrian Jewish refugees, and and um, people from the Soviet Union and other, and, and, and other refugees. So this was, um, this was Cordona, but it still exists like that, exactly in the same way. Um, in, um, so to understand how my father and his sister got from Ostrobozovietska, Poland, to Tehran, of all places, and then to Tel Aviv, um, let, let us just do a very quick historical Review. So uh, we know that in 1939, um, the, the Poland is partitioned between the Germans and the Soviets. In that period, in, in by the beginning of the 1930s, a million and a half Polish Jews lived on the Soviet side. Um, this is whether they fled. So here's Marta, who's the Yalisov. Marta is on the Nazi side, Yalisov is on the Soviet side. Also on the Michigan somewhere here. It's actually kind of the border town, more or less. You need the mic. Oh, sorry. Um, you hear me? Yeah. Is this better? Okay. So I'm saying this is Poland. Poland is partitioned after a number of weeks of fighting, the six weeks or so. Um, Warsaw ends up in the, in the, in the German side. Bialystok ends up in the um, Soviet side. Ostrobozovietska, where my father's family is from, is right here. It becomes a border town, more or less. And um, you have many, many people fleeing from the German <coughs> fleeing from the German side to the Soviet side. And we have to remember that this is not an easy decision. Right? I mean, they don't know what we know today. And they have already lived through World War I. They've already lived through both a Soviet and um, a German occupation. And for these people, it's not so clear who's better, the Germans or the Soviets. So uh, many, many people that I interviewed describe the situation where they're sort of, they leave home and they come back and they're not sure and so on. And Many people flee, and many people, they don't flee. I mean, if they live in Bialystok, they simply fell under Soviet occupation. Uh, of these people, of this million and a half people, about a third are deported to the Soviet interior to um, spend, and this, I'm sorry for this really tiny map. I haven't really found out how to enlarge it, but you can just see that there, this is just to show you that all of these of points of deportation. So it's all over the Soviet Union. It's not just, you know, we, we people talk about Siberian, deportation to Siberia, but it's not just Siberia. It's all over the Soviet Union. My father's family, this is Akhangelsk, so it's all the way in the north, and that's where they're deported. Um, the, the deportations are technically the deportations to what are called special settlements. So the special settlements are not gulags, as we know them from Solzhenitsyn and from literature about gulags. Technically, they're not gulags in the sense that they're not exactly um, about re-education and so on. It's basically the Soviet way of um, having slave laborers who will um, build the Soviet Union. You know, you, you get, you're put on a train, 
And um, this, these are the trains. Um, the, the train is boarded up, and you go, and you go, and you go, and you go, and um, you don't get food, and maybe you get a little bit of water. And um, really, these deportations are not that much different from the deportations to the, the, the concentration camps as, as we know them. And sometimes it's two weeks. People die on the way. And so on. Finally, you get somewhere. They said, "Get off." And if you're lucky, there are um, some kind of um, huts or shacks. And if they're not, if you're not lucky, then you have to build your own shack and so on. So conditions are very, very difficult in the, in the settlements. Uh, of course, we have to remember that most of these deportees are, you know, they haven't worked in lumber, right? I mean, they're mostly urban people and. Uh, they are um, work 14 hours a day and, um, and under these very different difficult conditions. Even uh, um, my father um, had to, he had just turned 13 and he worked. So if you're over 13, you worked. Uh, and um, and this is where they are. And this is the first. This is the first of um, of uh, really a six leg ordeal. That's why the book is so huge. Um, it's 400 pages because this is such a, this is a real odyssey and this is just the beginning um, of uh, of the journey. Um, and I should say also that um, Catholic Poles are deported as well, um, and um, and they and it's, so it's not just just Jews here. A year later, as we know, Nazi. Uh, so this is June 1940, 14 months. Like June 1941, Nazi Germany invades the Soviet Union, and these people's fate sort of turns. Right. So the 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 people who, um, if we go back to the map here, the people who were so many people were not deported. Right. Most people were not deported, and they basically remained right here on the border. They remained in the border towns. And those people, when the Nazi, when the Wehrmacht invades, are either executed uh, or they're ghettoized, and then they're later deported, and they are, they basically, they will be murdered. And the people who were deported, who thought that they, their fate was kind of the most awful fate, and so on, actually end up, end up being released by special amnesty from, from, from Stalin. So these people, in fact, are saved by their deportations. Right? And um, I have a moment in the book. So I travel to those places. And, um, to, and I travel to, to Komi, which is one of the areas where many, many people were deported. And um, those places are really still quite Soviet, you know, even though we're not in the Soviet Union anymore. But, um, I was in a hotel. There were two guys sitting there. There were two. There were plain clothes policemen, and everywhere I went, people already knew who I was. They were like, "Oh, you're the American who is speaking okay." Um, so then they I got an invitation to a local radio station. They just they knew I was there. So um, and it was a very it was a very nice, smart, interesting woman, and she said to me, um, "So uh, what do you think about Joseph Stalin?" <laughs> and, uh, and I said, look, you know, in the grand scheme of things, um, Stalin, you know, it was better, it was better than Treblinka. And um, she said, what's Treblinka? <laughs> which is also about, which is also kind of shocking, what people know and what people don't know, what we think people know. And so she truly didn't know what Treblinka. So, I mean, she knew, I guess, that there were, there were, there were camps. I, I mean, I assume that maybe not. Um, so these people are saved by their deportations, but their fate doesn't really improve. Um, in fact, in some ways it worsens, and they're, they're, um, they're released, and they head to Central Asia, which is really, um, Central Asia is really another deportation, except that it's not organized. So it's not, you don't, they, they basically you go on your own. Um, but as I found out, and again, you know, when you're writing, you're, your, your father's your father's story, and also when you just the way I grew up in Israel, I think you always have a fantasy that yeah he was lucky and it wasn't that bad and really um, 
was uh, you know it was he was almost like airlifted to to safety, but. Um, in fact, um, that's, that's not the case. I mean, they're released, they're actually much weaker and in a much worse state than in 39. They're released without anything, more or less. And they head to, they head to Central Asia. Um, and this is the Soviet Union, so it's not, and so again, I thought, and many people that I interviewed would say to me, and this is again sort of how we remember our stories, people would say to me, um, I went to, we went to Uzbekistan because I had asthma and my dad really wanted to take me to a dry place. And then I, when I was in there, I realized, no, this is the Soviet Union. You, you know, they, you, they tell you, you go to this and this village in this and this near Samarkand to stay with this Ahmadi family. And that Ahmadi family has no choice but to take you and you have no choice but to go. Uh, but still, there was a little bit more leeway in the sense that, um, again, this was not an organized deportation, and, um, and people got to all kinds of places, both in Kazakhstan and in Uzbekistan, um, and, um, and in uh, Turkmenistan, but mostly, mostly in Uzbekistan, uh, most of them, but, but quite a few in Kazakhstan as well. Many people wanted to get to Tashkent because in the 1920s there was um, a very, very popular novel called The Shkent City of Red that seems like all of them had read. And it, they, and it was uh, about a boy who goes to Tashkent to f and finds food. And it's kind of a, kind of a fairy tale about the Shkent. So people had you know, this, this, this um, desire to get to the Shkent. But in fact, Central Asia becomes, in 1942, it does become a little bit better later. It, it, the situation there is terrible. Uh, it's, in some ways, it's worse because it's hot. There are diseases, um, and there's a war now. So, because there is a war, the, the 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 Soviet government more or less decides that uh, Central Asia will be the labor front of the so of the Soviet army. In other words, they will produce the the food and and, and the clothing for the Soviet army and. Um, and if the locals die, they die, right? So they, they confiscate their food products, and of course the refugees are at the, at the, at the bottom of this food chain. Uh, and, and, and many, many people die in, in Uzbekistan, and, and especially in Uzbekistan, even more than Kazakhstan. Um, this is my grandfather deportation card. Um, and these are refugees in Bukhara in 1944. So, as I said, Conditions were very bad, and when an opportunity arose for Jewish children, Polish Jewish children, to leave the Soviet Central Asia together with the Polish army in exile, and which, which was evacuating to Iran, and I can explain that later, it's just too many details, and you can read the book, hopefully. Um, when there's an opportunity for these children to leave, my grandparents and many other people say, we're gonna send our children. If we die, we die, we'll save the children. Right? And, um, and there are all kinds of stories. And, and, and this was a very, very difficult moment. And again, you know, in the, in the grand scheme of the Holocaust, because everything is so horrible, this is considered a lucky story, right? And so, the, you know, I didn't, I never, it, it took me a long time to understand how traumatic this separation was. And in some ways, the separation may be the most traumatic thing. It was all very traumatic journey. So, um, and I was able to sort of reconstruct that separation. I was able to know, I, I, I was able to find where they were and to some way kind of reenact it. It was, I mean, it was, it was very difficult. Um, they sent them and they stayed. So the parent, they, my grandparents stayed and most Polish Jewish refugees stayed in Central Asia for the duration of the war. So these are Jewish refugees in Bukhara in 1944. They're holding a Yiddish paper. I mean, there was a lot of life there. Um, and even though there was, it was the Soviet Union, but there was the Zionist underground, and there were Bundists, and there were all kinds of, I mean, and, I mean this was, that was a, kind of its own story, and, um, and, um, and people survived there. Um, and so, um, so that was um, the grandparents, and, and, and hundreds of thousands of others. Um, and the relationships with the locals were, at least in 42, are pretty okay. I mean, in some ways, Uzbekistan becomes the land of Jews and Muslims in this period. Because it's not, you have Jewish refugees, 
You have Jewish evacuees who are Soviets who are evacuated from Moscow and from other cities. And you have the Kazakh and Tajik and Uzbek population all living there in this kind of strange combination that you know was pretty pretty okay. There's actually a very, one of the things that I quote in the book is uh, is a poem by an Uzbek poet, um, Gufor Golum, who wrote a poem called "I Am a Jew." He wrote it in 1942, and he really wrote it with kind of. Uh, um, kind of anti-fascist poem, writing from in the first person as a Jew. Um, one of the things that happens in Tashkent is uh, the Yiddish theater of Moscow is evacuated to Tashkent, so they hold Fiddler on the Roof in Tashkent. Um, then they do Uzbek plays in Tashkent, um, and all kinds of really interesting situations. Um, in, in those early years, then it becomes, everything becomes more complicated later in the Soviet Union. So, um, okay, so this is, um, maybe I'll stop here a little bit and say a little bit about my own search. And so I'm uncovering the details of what I just took you, really took, took many, many years. It's not that this is the only thing that I did, and I, mean, I teach, and I'm a mom, but um, it, it, this is t t tremendous work, uh, really tremendous, because, um, so I traveled to, to Poland twice, to Russia, to these, these remote areas, to Uzbekistan. Um, I couldn't travel to Iran, obviously, because I'm an, I'm an Israeli citizen. But uh, my colleague, who I told you was, is, was kind of like the trigger for all of this travel, he travels there in the summers, and he was able to do research there for me to the extent that it was possible. Uh, and of course, Israel, I, I traveled, and I um, traveled to archives all over the place, in many, many places. And so, uh, it, it took a long time to do this, and of course, in these regions, it's not that you can just travel, and you know, it, you can't just go to, in Uzbekistan, you can't even go as an independent researcher. I mean, you go, I mean, I went as, I mean, you can't just go and say, I want to look at KGB archives, please. <laughs> it's, like, it's not going to work out. So I basically had to travel as a, as a regular tourist of, of the Silk Road, and I had a kind of clandestine research assistant on the side who helped me. Um, so uncovering the details took a long time. Now, understanding what I was uncovering took even longer because, I mean, um, so Samantha said in the beginning that this story was uh, relatively unknown, but the truth is that it's, it's not exactly true that it was unknown. The, the, what, was, the, what was known are, so parts of it were known in different places because memory is, is collective. Now, collective, I mean, collective memory is a political thing, it's a national thing, right? So in each country, this story is remembered very differently. So, in um, in Israel, where I was when I was um, born and raised, this was so. In, in Israel, this is basically. Uh, taught as the story of, of, uh, of the rescue of Jewish children, um, and it was the story, story of rescue children. And so these, this is February 19, 1943. These children arrive um, in, um, on this day. They're on a train that's coming from, they disembark in the Suez Canal, and they're coming through Egypt into, into um, into Palestine. This is the town of Rehovot. So they there sort of have these Jewish towns along the way. School is um, school is uh, called off, and all the local children basically go out in the street and are you know. In fact, if you somebody has the book, the cover of the book is is, is taken from there. So the local children are like looking at the refugee children. Um, I mean, this is a scene that many, many Israelis of a certain age still remember. People say, I remember when the Tehran children came. Um, you have adults standing with signs that say, this is why we need a Jewish state. And many, and is, there are Israeli politicians who say, this is the moment I realized that, this is when I, I realized that, that we need a state for the refugees and so on. 
Um, you have people shouting at the children names of their relatives. You have to remember, this is February 1943. They still don't really know what's going on in Europe. I mean, they're hearing rumors. They know something, but they don't know exactly. And they're saying, did you see so-and-so, um, and so on. Um, so these children are really uh, kind of a huge deal. And, um, and in Israel, they're, I mean, they're um, welcomed by Henrietta Sold, who is uh, the founder of Hadassah, and who is in charge of youth immigration. And they're, they're um, at least initially, really taken care of very, um, very well. Um, but if you go to Poland and see, so I was done, by the way, this is my aunt right here uh, at the bottom, and you can see that even though there's so much excitement outside, you know, I don't know how she looks like to you, but to, to me she looks very overwhelmed and um, doesn't really know what's going on. And of course, these children, again, they're without parents, they've gone through tremendous suffering and Many of them actually don't understand Hebrew, uh, so um, I mean the children were from all kinds of families, not necessarily Zionist families, and um, she is is um, is overwhelmed. And um, but um, now this, if we go to Poland, where again I, I worked quite a bit. Now, the, for the Poles, this is a story of about the evil Soviet Union and its aggression towards the Poles and about the deportation. So it's not really. Uh, so basically, it's all about the deportations. This is a memorial, a, a monument to the murdered and fallen of the East in Warsaw. Now, as you can see, as you can see, like that, this monument is basically what's on it. So it's basically a wagon of crosses, except that most of the refugees and the most of the murdered and fallen of the East were in fact Jewish. <laughs> so there is, you can see it, but there is actually a very tiny uh, Star of David in the middle of these crosses. So this is kind of like this, this is about skewed proportions. It's not all complete erasure, but it's definitely skewed proportions. Um, so this is again, this story, um, this story is remembered as the story of the deportations, and uh, I mean, I don't know if it, my book was reviewed in the New York Times a few weeks ago, and um, the person who reviewed it said, um, this is an unknown story, and then I started getting all this like hate mail from polls, and they said, like, you know, this is known, we remember this very well, this is the story of our deportations, but the part about um, Iran is forgotten by the polls, and especially the part about Palestine, because as you'll see, one of the kind of strange things that happens in this journey is that most Polish Christian refugees end up in Palestine. Okay? More than the, so not that many Jewish refugees end up in Palestine, but the Christian refugees, and this is a Polish high school in Tel Aviv. So this part is not at all known in Poland and not at all talked about, but really the Jewish community of Palestine is actually the hosts of Poles in it were like in Tel Aviv. In fact, um, I, I mean, there, there, I, there's so many. Um, I, I worked in archives, but there were receipts. People were studying at Hebrew University. They were taking, um, I don't know, opera lessons with uh, German Jewish refugees who were in Jerusalem and so on. So, um, and they were there for many years. Um, so um, now, of course, in Russia, we know that there is no, there is no commemoration and there is no teaching of the deportations. I mean, this is the fate of, as we know, millions and millions and millions of Russians. Um, so everything that's there is sort of this uh, grassroots, this is a grassroots memorial um, that somebody made. Um, and, um, and that's really, uh, and, and I write quite a lot about Russia uh, because it's, I mean, that's very, I mean, that, that history is still in plain sight. I mean, they're basically these, um, these um, uh, oh, humongous, um, not even graveyards, basically mounds of, of earth where people were buried without any, any names and so on. Um, and Iran is, so in Iran there, there is actually, there is um, an Iranian documentary film called The Lost Requiem, and that's about Polish refugees in Iran. 
It's actually, you can, you can see it on YouTube, I think. But the, the Iranians are not really aware. That, I mean, first of all, they're not aware of the story altogether. I mean, so the fact that it was a documentary, you know, it doesn't mean that a lot of people saw it. Um, but um, there is, there are definitely people who saw it, including the director, who my friend, my colleague um, interviewed, Sinai is his name, they weren't aware that there were Jews among the Polish refugees. So they just think about it as kind of the exile of the Polish nation to Iran. So that's Iran. But in fact, there is a Jewish cemetery in Tehran, and there are many graves like this, which, you know, children, and uh, that in these 1937 to 1940 in Iran, um, again, many people died in Iran. There was typhus. I mean, they were taken care of, but they, they were already in such bad shape that, um, that they died. So in fact, those graves exist. Somebody takes care of them, but um, the story is not very well known. So again, so what my book did, in a way, is kind of marry all these archives together, uh, jump between all these archives, and, uh, and connect the dots. Uh, and my story became really something more than, so it's a story, it's kind of a global history of the Holocaust, in a sense, because it tells the story of these geopolitical relations and of of, uh, so it's by that my father and the Polish refugees, Polish Jewish refugees, but also about the Soviet Empire and the British Empire and the Iranian government and the Persian Jewish community and of course the, the Jewish Agency of Palestine and American, Jew, American aid organizations, the JEC, the, Jewish, the, the Joint Distribution Committee, who was helping these refugees and so on. So, um, so it's a big story. One, so after I was able to kind of in a way, understand some things. I realize a few things, and, and again, this may be banal in science, but it, it, it is nonetheless very hard to, for me to grasp, because again, I had this image of my father being rescued and lucky, but again, I realized that you know, this was truly a story of enormous, protracted, arduous, arbitrary path of suffering and starvation and terror from the beginning to end. And even in Israel, um, you know, I mean, the children, of course the children were taken care of, but it's not, you know, when you're without adults and without your parents, and um, it's, um, it's not easy. Uh, my father grew up in Kibbutz. He came from a very bourgeois family in Poland. Um, he, you know, did not, was not used to like you know, co-ed showers and stuff like that. So um, there was there was quite an adjustment, and that adjustment continued their whole lifetime. And this thing, because again, I mean, people weren't given reparations; they couldn't kick start, car, kick start their lives, and they had at least my father hard life, and I think many Tehran children did, um, but also um, became um, Tehran children also became um, as we just spoke to. There's a family here. Um, his, where the father was a Tehran child, and people be, and there were there were um, people fought in '48. I mean, remember these kids come in '43, and five like five years later, they're fighting another war, and many of them are exactly at that age. And um, I know maybe you can tell us later. I know one one person get got um, the Medal of Honor, and another person, another Tehran child, whose whose diary I, I will read you from in a minute, actually died. Um, I mean, a few people died in the war, but um, but uh, he died also and received the Medal of Honor. So, um, so that that happens. And at the same time, when you do the kind of research that I do, you realize that identities can be very arbitrary, right? Because in every place, and this is true for refugees today as well, in every place where people. Every place where people, every place of transit is an end point to many, many people, right? And that, for me, that was a kind of humongous insight because I thought, okay, you know, you go from point A to point B, but it wasn't like that. I mean, people actually, when I went to Russia, I realized that people actually were released from the settlements and they just stayed right there because they said, where are we going to go? It's a war, we have small children, maybe somebody gave them a cow, and they said, okay, we'll have like milk, we'll survive, and then they got caught behind the Iron Curtain, and that's it, they became Russians. Uh, this woman, 
that I interviewed. I interviewed her in Samarkand. She is Polish Jewish, exactly the same age as my father. He was born, they were both born in 27. She married an Uzbek man, and she remained in Samarkand. She remains there until this day. And in fact, um, you know, I asked her, how, was your, how would you summarize your life? Um, and I should say, you know, she, so she's in a, I'm interviewing her in this kind of courtyard with like the sewer, she's running sort of around, and, you know, and I said, how, and she said, you know, it's a, it was a good life. It started out very badly, but it worked out. I met a nice man. So, so you know, it, it's really, you know, you only think of your life as what, the life that you have, but then you realize, I mean, this was, there was so, there were so many different paths. People even stayed in Iran, and, um, since I, the book came out on October 1st, since then, several people have contacted me and told me that either they were born in Iran because their mom married an Iranian man, or, or you know, so it's mostly women who marry local men. And uh, I knew that there were many Polish Christian women who did that. Now I'm finding out that there were actually many, well, not many, but definitely there were Jewish women married local men and remain in Iran, as well as uh, apparently Jewish girls who were adopted in Iran. And uh, so the story of Iran actually is, I'm realizing since I published the book, is bigger than I even thought, because uh, people came there clandestinely in all kinds of interesting ways. So this guy, his mom is Polish and his father is Iranian, he still lives there, they have a shoe shop, and in fact he has a kind of a makeshift archives about these refugees in the basement of the shoe shop. Um, so, you know, that's, that's him. Um, so, we stopped in the historical overview. Um, these are, by the way, these are, um, you know, one last thing that I'll say about identities is that in 42, the Soviet government was encouraging locals to adopt children, to adopt refugee children, to adopt evacuee children. This was a sign of great patriotism, the creating kind of multi-ethnic Soviet empire. And so these, this was, uh, there was a kind of Uzbek blacksmith who became the symbol of this. He adopted 10 children. And as you can see, they're Korean. So these are all deportee children. Koreans were deported and Jews and Poles and, and whatnot, uh, and so those children, of course, became Uzbek children. Um, this is Bandar Pahlavi, where the, 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 um, the everybody, they, they arrive, and um, how are we doing the time? Ten more minutes, okay. Um, so I wanted to read, I told you that um, I had a diary, one of my greatest sources was a travel diary, it was a child, Warsaw born child, Emil Landau, who wrote a travel diary. I was able to get that travel diary. He wrote it in Polish, and I had it translated, and it's a fantastic source. Um, he was an incredibly smart boy, great writer, understood geography. I was sort of shocked. I was like, you know, that's what he knows at 15. He was really sophisticated. So this is what he writes about the day that arrived in Iran. On the historic day of August 16, 1942, in 40 degrees and some weather, the first group of passengers leave on the, leaves on the tugboat's dock and after half an hour gets to the small port Bandar Pahlavi. Difficulty transmitting writing, our first impression. Each one feels as if he is born again, has come to a place out of this world. The port's waters are littered with colorful boats. The surroundings are mowed lawns and flower beds. Rows of impressive Chevrolets and Studebakers wait for transport. And everything seems good and beautiful. Everything smiles together with the Persians who gaze at us with pity. After we are on shore, everyone hugs everyone. Um, of course, the, does anybody know where, like, who, where those Chevrolets and Studebakers came from? From here, right? So this is uh, the beginning of the land lease, the beginning of American aid, basically, to the Allies. And at this point, most of the aid is coming in the form of trucks. And so these trucks are being shipped through Iran. This is a Life magazine ad, 1943. It says, Studebaker military trucks 
like our Yanks, are certainly seeing the world. And so these children, these Polish-born children, my father, whose family had a brewery where they had Chevrolet trucks, they're like, the first thing they see are these trucks. And, um, so it's, you know, it's, it's quite a happy moment. Um, and um, as I said, they are later um, very quickly collected. This is a, a photo from the camp in Tehran. Um, this is my father, the one with the hair, <laughs> which makes me happy that he had hair because uh, they, of course all the children had lice and other things and um, for some reason he was able to, to keep his hair. Uh, and um, they start um, getting some kind of Zionist education. Um, they are, some, some of them are hosted by Persian local community, Persian Jews. Um, actually, believe it or not, the older children, some of the older children are taken to see to the great dictator in a cinema in Tehran. <laughs> Um, and, um, and they stay there uh, until they are um, evacuated to Palestine. The story of the evacuation is very complicated. Yeah. Right. Well, it was India. That's right. So, as you can see, Iran, so actually Tehran and Tel Aviv are really close, right? I mean, if you, you can actually drive from Tehran to Tel Aviv in a very short time by land. But the problem was, as you can see, what's between Iran and, and uh, Iraq. Iraq would not let these Jewish children pass to Palestine in 1943. The Arab-Jewish conflict is already surging. Um, and um, I, there, Eleanor Roosevelt herself writes to the Iranian, to the Iraqi prime minister and says to him, this is a humanitarian case, these are children. And they say, well, you know, we're very sorry for them and we'll be happy to keep them in Iraq if you pay for them, but we're not gonna let them go to Palestine. So they end up going, having to really cross half the world again. In this really crazy, crazy journey aboard British warships through the Gulf, the Indian Ocean, which of course is, um, full of sea, German sea mines. I mean, this is a very, da I mean, the, the very dangerous journey, a scary journey through Aden um, and in, through the Suez Canal. And, um, and uh, they stopped in uh, Karachi, uh, as you said. I mean, that, it, it, this is before, it's Pakistan, it's India. They stopped there for two weeks and many refugees end up in, in India as well. Um, and they, and, and they arrived Palestine in February, and there's, there's another transport in, um, of children in August. Now, how they get there, how, who brings them, um, you can read in my book again, I hope. Um, but I'll say, I'll give you a hint. In Iran, in 1942, are members of Solel Bene, which is a construction brigade based, a Jewish construction brigade based in Palestine. And some of these dudes here, are work a clan, clandestine members of uh, of basically an illegal immigration organization to to Palestine. It's called Mossad Aliyah Bet, and in fact, it will become the head of that organization will become the head of Mossad, the first head of Mossad as we know Mossad today. Um, so they, they this is a kind of result of political as well as sort of uh, you know, other other. Um, efforts. Um, once the Jewish organizations end up in Iran, even after the refugees leave, they don't leave. So the JDC stays in Iran and uses Tehran as a base from where to send packages into the Soviet Union. So of course most of the refugees are still trapped in Central Asia and these packages are being sent to them uh, by, and that again, that is a very um, Aid comes from to the United States and also from Palestine. These Mossad guys come to Iran and basically they try to, to cross the border into the Soviet Union. They, they want to try to get to these refugees and, and, and help them. And, 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 and they die. I mean, several of them 
you know, they try to cross the Soviet border, the Soviets shoot them, and they try again. So, uh, I mean, this is its own story. Um, this is my father in 19... It's a portrait deck, is that right? We did the Siberia, Uzbekistan, Persia group, my brother and I, 80 years ago. Uh, father, uh, when we got to Persia, got the job to be the manager of, of Jordan. And he figured out how to get packages that would not be consumed, but would be sold on the black market. So That's right. If people received it, they could live. There was really, uh, I, I write about that, and there, I mean, there was really tremendous, I mean, one of the things that, um, it, it was it, the, the aid efforts of the joint and of the Zionist Agency of Palestine really worked together, more or less, are incredible. I mean, which is, you know, we, we know that there are questions of American Jews in the Holocaust and so on, but the, the ways, as you said, I mean, the, the amount of thinking that was put into what will go in these packages that could be sold um, and, the, and sustain people. And people were sustained by these packages. Um, and this is the reason I think why many people did survive. Um, so this is my father in Kibbutz and Hamod in 1944. Um, and um, and my, so my story basically ends in, in 49. Um, in terms of um, the family story. Um, so, as I said, not all Jewish refugees were evacuated from Iran to Palestine. Some stayed in Iran, some went to Lebanon, um, and to East Africa, and to other places. Um, as I told you, Christian refugee Poles ended up in Palestine, and they would remain there until 47. They would remain there until the end of the British mandate of, over Palestine. So, I interviewed a Polish woman who lives in Denver, she said, those were the best years of my life. Uh, so we went to the sea, we went to the beach, it was so great, so um, they leave, and of course these guys fight in 48, and Israel is founded, and after Israel is founded, their, mother, their parents and all the people that were basically, um, especially the people who, people left, people were able to leave um, Central Asia, we, we repatriated to Poland, ended up in displaced persons camps, and then after the state of Israel came through, came there. Um, so this is where my, the story ends. Um, I should, so I should say just a few things, uh, one last thing, maybe a comment about um, my work method. And so, um, so I said that, um, so this book became, I mean, it, Again, I, I know many people know the story, and at the same time, it's not very well known. And um, and people, since the book came out, people write me all the time and call me and text me and whatever, find me, and, and they say, uh, "Oh my God, my mom was in Uzbekistan, and but I thought she was the only one." And I was like, yeah, "There are a quarter million people," but so and I think when there is not a story, I mean, they, we, we know we've. We, we, when we think about Auschwitz, and if you discover that your parent is an Auschwitz survivor, you read Primo Levi, you read Art Spiegelman, you know what that means. But if you discover that your mom was in Uzbekistan, maybe you don't know what that means. And if you don't know what that means, you can think that it was only her story, even though it's a huge story. And so, really, I'm hoping that the book will become that, that, that book that will give people at least um, a kind of framework to which, uh, to, through which to understand their own their own story. The book also does extend sympathy also to to non-Jews in the sense that um, you know and this is a very Jewish story, and at the same time Stalin deported 33 million people of all uh, nationalities, uh, and my father's fate was linked with so many with the residents of these nations and rescuers and aid organizations and ordinary citizens and. Um, and my own book involved the, a, lot, a lot of collaboration with others. Um, I mean, this was Salar, my colleague, who, was really, who helped me quite a bit. This is Magda Gowen, this was my host in Poland, uh, who, I kid you not, is now the Deputy Minister of Culture of the PIS. 
Uh, so she's a, she's a kind of conservative um, Polish historian. Um, I didn't know that. I just thought it's you know, she's my host. Um, but she, she also helped me quite a bit. And um, this was my, uh, my uh, host in Russia, who was a kind of mini oligarch of sorts, um, which is a very good thing if you're traveling to those, to those areas. Um, and this was my my helper in uh, in Uzbekistan, who is uh, who is a Korean Uzbek, and he was uh, he was a Presbyterian, which is just not a good thing to be in Uzbekistan. Um, but much worse than being Jewish, because Jews are considered indigenous, and um, so he was really risking to help me, and he was very identified with the Jewish story in part because all his classmates in Tashkent were Jews, were among these refugees and deportees and so on. So, you know, we're in the Museum of Jewish Heritage and we know that Jewish heritage is a very heavy burden to carry and you sort of want that Jews to help you carry that. I mean, to, I, I, I mean, that was very attractive, but of course when somebody helps you carry the, your burden, they have their own burdens. Each one of them, he had a story of exile. Salar, uh, my Iranian friend, is actually a refugee of the 79, um, 1979 revolution, Iran Islamic revolution. Magda's aunt was killed and so on. And so the story that I tell is also about my dialogues with these people, which, you know, I'm not going to pretend and say it's, it's not we are the world, Schindler's, the, you know, it's not like, I mean, this is really, um, these dialogues can be hard because they have their own histories, and sometimes those histories or the stories clash, right? So the Polish narrative and the Jewish narrative, or even Iran and Israel today. Um, and in some ways, I think my, my book offers hope in the sense that it's about talking through these difficulties and continuing to be dialogue that is both exhilarating and hard. So I'll stop here. Thank you. So we have time for a few questions. Um, I ask that you please don't shout your questions. I'll come to you with the microphone. Um, when the children came on the boats to Alexandria as a boy and then took the train, I was on one of those trips. I wasn't from there, my husband was, but I was in Israel and they had a hope they had a memorial and they went through the whole subject. You know, uh, a lot of these survivors, and I happened to be part of it at the time. Do you remember that? So I, yeah, I surely do. So they said that they, on the boat, they, was, they were part of a convoy of uh, boats, and like you said, there were submarines, and one boat was sunk. And the whole issue in Israel, the whole community in Israel, was in mourning. They thought it was the boat with all the children. But then it turned, it was another ship. So I just wanted to make that point. That was one of the situations. Thank you. First of all, thank you so much. This was amazing. I didn't know a lot about it before. Um, I just wanted some, just some clarification, um, some points that you mentioned already. Um, again, can you say how many Tehran children were they approximately? And then also, I was a little bit confused as to how long exactly the a length of time they stayed in Tehran. And then also, um, I didn't really understand how the, out of the expedition lasted with their parents. So they were just to clarify, they you know left the Soviet Union with their par parents and went to. Oh, sorry, they they left Soviet and where they did their parents come with them or what happened? What was the fate of their their parents after they you know the kids left for Iran? Like you know, did they stay in the Soviet? Like what was that about? Yeah. So. As I said, most people stayed exactly there. They stayed in, in Samarkand. I mean, my grandparents stayed in Samarkand. They stayed in the same place that they, before all this whole time, they, they, they should, there was an address. And um, Henrietta Sold, who actually wrote to the parents and so on, so they had contact, but they stayed. So they stayed in Central Asia until 
45. In 45, there was a repatriation agreement between the Soviet Union and Poland, and some people were able to actually, Jews, Polish Jews and Andrews, were able to re return to Poland. They returned to Poland, uh, which is the story of many, many people. Um, Poland was, um, you know, during the deportations in the Soviet Union, Poland is, is, is a kind of, um, there is a kind of, uh, Imagine it's, it's the old paradise. It's, I mean, he, there is a really wonderful um, memoir by Alexander Watt. He's a Polish Jewish intellectual. He said, We forgot all the anti Semitism, we forgot everything. Our life seemed to us like heaven. Um, so, everybody, people want to return to Poland, but of course, when they return to Poland, uh, we know what happens. Uh, some people do stay in Poland. Uh, but most people don't stay and they leave. And my grandparents, I mean, I don't have any document or anything. That, what, I just know that they went there. I know that they stayed there. I have the dates. That's all. So I know that they were there for about two weeks. Uh, I assume they went to their hometown. That, as I said, they owned a brewery. The brewery, as I found out during the war, became Gestapo headquarters. Um, so one of the kind of tragic and awful things, that co coincidences, is that that woman, Magda Gawain, my host, is her great aunt is executed inside the brewery, basically. Uh, and there are many, many testimonies of what went on inside the brewery, it was terrible. Um, including the, I have the stationery of the head of Gestapo, like they have, it has like their address on it. Um, so I, I know that the Nazis, they, that they blew up the brewery when they left, um, and the Poles sort of raised the rest, so I guess they just went back and they saw that there's nothing there, and of course they wanted to get to it. So they left, they ended up in a displaced person's camp in first in Austria and then in Germany. My grandfather died there uh, in 49, so he did not see the children again. And, um, and, my, and he's still buried in Munich. And my grandmother, as I said, left for, was able to, to join the kids in Palestine. But we have to remember that Again, there was no Israel. This was the British control of the borders, and they did not let people in after the war. I mean, there was some, there was some reunification, there was some reunification of children and parents, but not very much. So they ended up actually being separated from their mother for seven years. Uh, in a way, for the grandparents, forty-five was just the middle of the ordeal. I mean, they continued being refugees for years and years after that. Um, the children, there were, there, so there were two transports, um, one in February and one in August of, of 1943. And the first transport um, is, I think, it's around 800 or so, and in the second transport, around 120. Um, and, um, and of course, there were other children, as I said, who didn't come to, not very many, but there were more Jewish children who actually didn't come to, to Palestine. So these were the numbers. Uh, did your father maintain any connection or relation with any of these other people that he shared the experience with? That's part one. And part two, was there a gathering of the Tehran children at some point in the time? Yeah, I mean, they, my father, uh, so as I said, he grew up in Enchabod. Enchabod is the first, what they call, large kibbutz in Israel. So in the world, you know, before that, kibbutzim were sort of like these closed systems, only for members. And so what was the first kind of open kibbutz, and they took in uh, 12 Tehran children. And those Tehran children who grew up in that kibbutz, they were, yes, we, we, they were in close touch. Um, they also had a relative, uh, a distant relative in the kibbutz, and so on. So we actually, as a child, we used to go visit there. But, you know, my father, um, in some way, some people, there were some gatherings, some people were in touch. My father, I think, and my aunt wanted to, they didn't want to embrace, they wanted to sort of be Israeli. Uh, they didn't want to, I think, embrace that whole past. And um, so they are, and, and my father was a little bit of a recluse anyway. So um, not, and, and he didn't, no, there was no official commemoration. A few years ago, there, there is a Tehran Children uh, documentary. It's really, it's actually very, very moving. It's made by an Israeli director. Um, it's very different from my book because, uh, as in my book, 
really does a lot of research in other places, but it um, follows the story of six people. And um, I think there is more, now more, first of all, they are considered Holocaust survivors from now, so it is, they're sort of been absorbed into it in Israel. Um, and I think people do see each other more, uh, but of course many people are not alive anymore. Um, so, yeah. It's called um, The Journey of the Tehran Children. The, document, the filmmaker is Dalia Gutman. Uh, you can't get it online, unfortunately. Uh, you, can, you have to sort of order it. Um, but it's, um, it, it's highly interesting. It follows one of the people, many of the, quite a few of the Tehran children, including my father, became military people. Partly because that was the, uh, the only place they could go. Right? I mean, the military, I mean, certainly my father was not a military type. And, um, and one of the, the most famous um, Tehran children is, is Yanush Bengal, who was a general, an Israeli general, a famous Israeli general. And in 73, he was in charge of, um, of the north, he was the, the fighting in the north against Syria, which is kind of the most difficult fighting, really. And um, he, that, his units, they said, were the most prepared. Because as we know, 73 was kind of took Israel by surprise in some ways, but his units were the most prepared. And he said, in that movie, he says, it's because I was a refugee and I was prepared, I knew that you had to prepare. So when, even though Israel, Israelis in general were sort of still, um, you know, basking in the, in, the, in the success of the 1767 war, he was much more cautious, and as a result, was much more, you know, successful. Um, so uh, there, there are definitely those very interesting stories. Yes, some questions in back. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for, for your book. Uh, the question is, uh, how much has been written about it before, and did you use any materials? Because I don't believe that you are kind of a Groundbreaker in this sense, I believe that uh, people wrote at least, at, least, at least articles about it. So, did you use anything? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, I wrote, there's a lot of material in Israel. Um, there's a lot of material on what happens to the children in Israel because that's, that's also a story of like who gets to raise these children and they're and they're divided between. Um, religious institutions and socialist institutions. In the case of my father is actually, uh, and his sister, they're actually in war. I mean, they're, they're sent to the kibbutz and then their relative rights, you know. Um, you know, these children come from a religious home. They're not gonna, they're gonna eat pork in the kibbutz. And, um, and so Henrietta Salt writes their parents in this whole ordeal. So a lot of this, I use that literature. I use literature, uh, some articles by, by Polish people. By Iranian, so uh, yeah, I mean, of course, um, they do. I'd like to go back to the image of the memorial to the fallen in the East that everybody laughed at, because I think you really misrepresented what that is. That memorial was erected in 1995 and was the first memorial for the people who were taken, a million Polish citizens who were taken and deported into Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, to the Bolsheviks, to the people who were sent to the Galapulas, to the people who were sentenced to re-education camps. So when you said that the people who died in the East were mostly Jews, you totally denigrated what happened to the people? That East is not the East of Poland. That East is the Kazakhstans, the Uzbekistans, the Mordovas. Yeah, no, I, 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 actually I don't mean to denigrate the Poles, and I actually write quite a bit about Polish suffering and so and on. And you but put I think, it yeah. down in your statements about yeah. the hospitals. Yeah. You indicate that Polish, Polish hospitals were better supplied than the hospitals where Jewish people were. My mother was a nurse in one of those hospitals. People lay on rubber ponchos because there were no sheets, there was no medications, the people who had typhus. So I'm not going to agree with you with everything. You don't mention the children, the orphans that were sent to New Zealand, 800, more sent to Australia. I'm sorry, I listened here for an hour 
And I think that this book would have been a lot better had you talked about that. Actually, I do mention the children in New Zealand, and I do mention the Polish children who are in Isfahan, uh, so I do mention that. Um, I do think that, unfortunately, Poles and Jews in Uzbekistan and in Iran, especially in Iran, there are tremendous tensions. I do think that Jewish refugees were discriminated against. In the, in the, this doesn't mean that the Poles didn't suffer, and I never said that, but I do think that more aid made it, less aid made it to Jewish refugees. Um, and I'm not, it's not only me, but uh, I mean, there's, there, that's, that's very, uh, that's documented uh, in report and so on. Um, this, I, you know, for a moment I don't pretend like Paul had it easy because they, I mean, there was tremendous suffering. We have time for two more questions. I happen to be a Tehran shop. And if you want to hear from me stories, I have different. She said that she happens to be a terrible child, and if you want to hear more stories, she has them. Um, one more question. Question here, yes. Yes, I'm interested. So I'm interested in the linguistic perspective. What language, say talking about your father, did he speak when he was deported or evacuated from Poland? What did he speak in Central Asia and in Iran? How did he learn Hebrew? My father came from a from a Zionist home, not, um, in, I'm not necessarily, um, I mean, he had, he had some Jewish education. They would go to Tarbut, which is a Jewish uh, Zionist um, elementary school chain, uh, school chain, and he, so he knew a, a little Hebrew, um, and, and then, and also, and then they would go for high school to the Polish gymnasium. Um, so he, they spoke, and he had Yiddish from home. Um, I don't know what language they spoke on their journey. I do know that one of the things that, um, interesting things that happened is I, I, these children gave testimonies because the Polish government in exile took testimonies from refugees, both Jewish and Christian refugees, in Iran and in Jerusalem. And I, for years I searched my father's testimony, I couldn't find it. Um, among all the testimonies that were at the Hoover Institute and so on, which is where most of the testimonies are. Then, one day I realized, uh, anyway, through some kind of coincidence, that he had given his testimony in Yiddish. What year did they give the testimonies in They gave the testimonies in Jerusalem, the, these children. To the Polish government in exile had an information office in Jerusalem, and they interviewed the Polish born refugees, Jewish and non-Jewish, non who were in Jerusalem. So most of the refu most of them gave interviews in Polish. He gave, he and a few others gave it in Yiddish. I have no idea why, whether he chose to uh, as a kind of rebellion or whether he, just the person who interviewed him was Yiddish speaker, but uh, I found it, his testimony in, a, in an archive in um, Neibrat, which is a kind of ultra-Orthodox town in, in a little archive there. So um, I, believe, I, 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 I guess they spoke Yiddish, Polish, um, when they, and then they learned Hebrew. In the kibbutz, they had really great teachers who were very dedicated to them, um, and they, they, I guess they learned very quickly. Thank you so much, Mikal. Unfortunately, we're out of time, but we do want everyone to get a chance to buy the book downstairs. So um, can we please have another round of applause?